Hey, Matt, this is Brian Sullivan. Trent. Thank you, Alice. I'll start over. Uh, as a preliminary matter, this is Brian Sullivan, Chair of the Affordable Housing Trust. Permit me to confirm all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Rima Sherry. Here. Chantal Murphy. Here. Tom Dixon. Thank you. Here. Um, Brian Sullivan is here. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Uh, Ellis Ramos. Here. Uh, Tucker Holland. Here. Vicki Marsh. Here. Great. Thank you, everybody. Anticipated speakers on the agenda, please respond in the affirmative. Judy Barrett. Here. Julia Lindner. Here. Uh, Caleb, uh, Caleb Worston. Here. I'm not sure. I, uh, okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair. Yes. I just also would like to take the opportunity to introduce uh, Eric from KP Law, who's here with Vicki today. Um, Eric is going to be assisting Vicki going forward, and he's here today to get familiar with what we do. Excellent, well, Eric. Welcome, Eric. Thank you yeah. For, yeah, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. Um, good afternoon. The open meeting of the Affordable Housing Trust is being conducted remotely pursuant to Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. For this meeting, the Affordable Housing Trust is convening by a video conference via the Zoom app. as posted on the town's website identifying how the public may join. Please note that the meeting is being recorded and all attendees are participating via video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and to take care not to screen share your computer. Anything you may broadcast may be captured by the recording. All materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless otherwise noted. We'll turn to the first item on the agenda. Permit me to, uh, before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I'll introduce each speaker on the agenda. They conclude their remarks. We'll go down the line of members, inviting each to provide their name and any comments, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly in a way that helps generate accurate meeting minutes. For any response, please wait until the floor is yielded to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in conversation with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. After members have spoken, the chair will afford public comment to those members of the public that have joined the meeting via the Zoom. Members of the public who wish to speak must state their names, be acknowledged, and speak through the chair. Finally, each vote will be taken via roll call. Um, <clears throat> with that, I'd like to make an edit to the agenda. Uh, before I do that, I welcome Dave Iverson to the meeting and Penny Dye. So the first thing I'd like to, I'd like to roll all of the meeting minutes to the next meeting, as I understand that there are late edits and additions to them. Um, so Ellis, if those could be pushed forward to the next meeting and then circulated to the trust um, after the meeting, so we have time to review them prior to the next meeting. Um, is there a motion for that? I'll make that motion. And a second? Second. second. Okay, great. Uh, Dave beat Rima, or Tom beat Rima by roll call. Rima Sherry? Aye. Tom Dixon? Aye. John Tom Murphy? Aye. Penny Dye? Aye. Dave Iverson? Aye. And Brian Sullivan is an I. Um, with that, I think I'll look for a motion to approve the agenda as amended. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, moved by Rima, second by Dave, by roll call, Rima Sherry. Aye. Tom Dixon. Aye. John Tom Murphy. Aye. Penny Dye. Aye. Dave Iverson. Aye. And Brian Sullivan and I. Uh, so that brings us to item number four on the agenda, public comment. We have a lot of people joining us today. Thank you, everybody. Does anyone have comments as members of the public? Seeing none, I'll close public comment. Uh, let's give Mr. Dubard a moment since he just made it in under the wire. Not to put him on the spot, but...
I'm going to close public comment and move on to item number five, the year-round deed restriction action plan discussion. Judy, I hope you are wonderfully refreshed from your time away and ready to dig in. The floor is yours. So I I believe what we need to talk about today is probably confirming this up the schedule. Am I right about that? Because that I sent you guys some revised dates and times. I think it was last week. Alice, I think you've taken a stab at trying to kind of plug people into those dates. So I think we just need to know, are we going with those dates or do we need to modify them in some way? I think that's what I need to know because for me to continue to make these adjustments in the schedule, I have to kind of look at Nantucket in relation to some other projects and just think about various deadlines. I'm fine with moving them if you need me to, Brian. I just want to know today. Un understood. So, Ellis, in a moment, I'll ask you to share the dates with everybody so we can kind of walk through that. But to update the rest of the members of the trust, um, we learned yesterday that the marketing information went out to approximately 300 people. Um, there have been 26 individuals that have signed up for um, inclusion in the work groups. Um, some Ellis made some direct phone calls to people that were on the list who didn't see the email and didn't see the opportunity to sign up. Um, we have asked the town's marketing department to open up the sign up opportunity again because it closed two days ago. Um, so in doing that, there is an opportunity for more people to sign up for a public comment period or um, what's the term we're using? Focus groups, uh, for focus groups. Uh, the hope is that more individuals from the trust and people can make direct contact rather than a blanket email to garner a further level of participation. Um, with that, Alice, can you share the revised dates on the screen so everybody can give input to Judy? I, Judy, you responded to one email that I was on that maybe we move the focus groups a little later to try and get more participation. Yeah, I mean, I had said, because I had the same concern, frankly, about how quickly we were asking people to respond. So all I was trying to say is that if you folks feel like you need to extend the time for people to respond, um, I mean, right now we're talking about launching these next week, which which is tight, but I'm, we can do it. It's just that it's tight. So all I was trying to say and my note to you, Brian, is that, you know, if this is really an issue and you want to give people more time, we should look at bumping these to, you know, probably the second week in October. Yeah. My we perspective, I'm sorry. My perspective is it's less about the amount of time for people to respond, but we need more time to inform. There's a lot of people not informed yet. I see. Well, what information have people received? There was a flyer that we approved at the last meeting to drive right. traffic to people to sign up. But what we're recognizing is that that flyer only went to about 200 addresses, two to two to 300 email addresses, and a number of them, it must have gone to spam because they've never seen it. So we need to uh, make an effort to communicate with people directly because people that we followed up with with phone calls yesterday want to participate and sign up, Yeah, but it was closed for sign up and so basically we need more time okay so what do you need me to do do you need me to produce a revised schedule brian because i can do that if you want me to i just need direction from the trust do any members of the trust have a thought or opinion on this go ahead reva yeah, I think uh, moving the focus groups back starting second week in October, uh, now that we have an easy link that we can share with people, um, would uh, probably be the best idea. I have a thumbs up from Mr. Dixon, Dave Iverson. So, Judy, yes, the request is to revise the dates in a way to accommodate a little more time for trust members to market the opportunity. Um, I'll look to some of the other housing advocates that are on the call today, um, Ms. Linder at Act Now and maybe sure. and at Housing Nantucket to help distribute the information. Ellis, if you can make sure they both have it. I think they both have great mailing lists. Um, 
So the only thing to be aware of is that the way we originally designed the whole schedule, we would do that first round of focus groups and then do a community meeting approximately a week later. So I need to think about that as well, because we certainly don't want to be promoting a community-wide conversation meeting without a lot of notice too. So let me, let me, I'll work on this while we're all talking and see what I can come up with. Okay, great. Anybody have any other questions for Judy at this moment in time? Yes, Rima. Well, it's it's more a question for Ellis. Um, was this sent out to uh, Nantucket Current and Daybreak as um, as a little press release? Because if they published it, um, that would be a lot of people seeing it. So Current did pick it up, and they were they did include it in their um, one of their newsletters. Yeah, I missed it. Um, I missed it. I didn't see it, um, so I'm not sure how it stood out. I have recognized that. The individuals that I have forwarded the email to with commentary have been very interested in interacting, um, but the blanket ones that I followed up with afterwards didn't necessarily acknowledge receiving it. Okay. Um, Ellis? So um, when I talked to the communication department, they said that it was sent out to the current, but it was only sent out to their free newsletter. They also asked if I could ask the trust if this is something that we wanted to spend some money on and put it on um, news outlets that you have to pay for. They they only did it to the outlets that were free. So if that's of interest to the trust, I would suggest that we put out a number not to exceed and then give them the opportunity to do it. There was no dollar value in that understanding. So we can't vote for a specific amount. Um, yeah. Anyone have interest in advertising it either with the Inquirer Mirror or Nantucket Current newsletters or Nantucket About Town or any others? Tucker? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess my, like, so we originally had identified um, several different focus groups by theme or professional or um you know citizen of the island and i and i guess i would i think it might be useful to look at of those respondents that we have so far how are those groups filling out you know this is sort of an internal exercise but look at how those are filling out and seeing where we have holes so that we can make specific outreach to have the kind of representation that we're looking for. I don't know whether a general ad in the paper is going to necessarily solicit who we're looking for. Not that I'm against an ad in the paper, but I, I, I do think we want to ultimately have that representation that we uh, all said we is important to this work. <clears throat> and Alice? I have um, sent out, I think I sent it out a bit late, but I sent out the, like, I did what T what Tucker was saying. I placed the people that applied into, into different focus groups that I think they fit in. So if you guys want to take a look at them, um, I think what we're, you know, lacking out of its employees have not, I don't have that many people. Um, Spanish and Portuguese speaking, I haven't got anybody. I did talk to a couple of people yesterday. They, they said they're going to apply, but not yet. Um, less heard constituents too. I haven't heard from many people. There is a ton of real estate um, professionals that are interested and bankers that are interested as well. But the, the people that we wanted to include, that we talked about include inclusion so much, I haven't seen them yet. Shanta, thank you, um, Alice. I, I, just from looking at the list that Ellis shared, um, I think we we it would be more beneficial if we focused on trying to fill those groups that clearly are lacking folks versus putting a blanket ad in the paper and the, I did see the, 
I read the current every, I read all the dailies every day. Um, and I did see it in there. Um, it did stand out to me, but again, I'm in this group. So I think I would expect it to, um, I would pick up on it more than I think just general constituents would um, in those, in, in, in so all of what they have going on. But I think that we need to do direct outreach to the folks that fill the groups versus those blanket um, ads. Cause I don't, I don't think we're gonna be able to focus on the inclusive aspect of what we're trying to accomplish. I agree with that. How do you propose the best way for us to make direct contact with various groups? Is it individual trust members or delivering information to Ellis in a way that she can then do it? They just want to make sure we're executable on the suggestion. I think that because we're the ones that sent her the list of folks. So if we go through the list um, of, of people who have, who have actually signed up and we see that there are people on there that we think should be there, we make the, we reach out to them. I think also as okay. trust members, we signed up to do this work, so we should step in and try to help out in this regard. Okay, great. All right, so with that, we'll move past designating any particular budget to regular advertising. Um, Penny, I'll come to you. Yeah, just quickly, um, through, through you, Brian, to Ellis, how do you want us to handle suggestions on the list that you sent us right before the meeting? You want us just to call and tell you where we would move people around if we feel they should be? So you can um, move them around and use a specific caller um, okay. and do it like we would do a red line okay. on, on the thing. And then just send it back. Okay. Yeah. And then send it back and then we will um, communicate back and forth and edit Thank it you. until it's the perfect. Thank you. That's what I'll do. Thank you. Shanta? Would it be helpful putting this in, in like a Google Doc that we can all then edit? No, I think I think there's some issue with using Google Docs. Open okay. meeting law issue. Oh, uh, gotcha. Okay, thank you. But I love the idea. Huge fan. Rima. Yeah, I see that town officials um, group and um, employees is very small. Is there a way to uh, send out direct emails with the link to um, all the? Uh, town officials, employees, and also, you know, committee members and board members? So um, HR usually does that. And it, it's the, my understanding that the town officials did not get the first link. Okay. Well, let's send that but, again. Um, I did. I just did this morning. I made sure that I sent it out. Great. Wonderful. I think, you know, uh, that that just jumped out to me. And I know some some board members um, on other boards that I would love to have included, but I don't have their emails and I know the town does. So, so maybe I could just go blanket again. Send me their names and I can, um, I can oh, see good. if I can get the emails. Okay, thank you. All right, great. So it seems that we have a plan to, for, for a new push of getting the information distributed. Um, anything else on deed restriction conversation for today? So, yes, Penny. Can you just tell me what are we clear on the deadline? Did we move it? So the deadlines for signups have been moved, and it um, as far as the ability to sign up on the paperwork. Yeah. And help me out, Ellis. Is it the twenty seventh of September? The twenty fifth of September. Thank you. All right, excellent. Um, with that, we will close year round deed restriction and um, open item seven, act now lease to rental program. Um, Ms. Lindner, I'll give you the floor to describe the program. Um, some paperwork was distributed to the trust the other day so we could take a look at it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm gonna share my screen if you don't mind. Uh, so we've been talking about this program for um, for a long time, uh, and we're really excited to have it finally um, up and running. And so this um, is actually the first program for our new affiliate organization, ACNOW Community Initiatives. 
And Act Now Community Initiatives is really focused on, um, it's a 501c3, so it's a charitable organization, and it's focused on solutions to help maintain the year-round community. Um, it's got a big focus on housing, but it's, housing is not the only focus. Uh, for example, one of the areas we're really interested in looking at is how to keep local businesses in local hands. Um, but housing seems to be the number one challenge for uh, the community and, and the local economy. And so that's what we're um, plunging into. And mainly, I think when, you know, when I sat with uh, Ann Kutzba and she said, so what's the difference between Housing Nantucket and Act Now Community Initiatives? And not only is our mission broader, but when it comes to housing projects or uh, programs, we're looking at mainly non-income restricted. And that's uh, sort of the donut hole that maybe has been. Um, and that, you know, you guys are talking about filling with the year round uh, deed restriction program. So that's really wonderful news. It's a fabulous idea. So the first program for Act Now Community Initiatives is the, is the Lease to Locals program. We did not develop the Lease to Locals program. It was developed by a company called Placemate. Um, which I'll talk really briefly about. So they were really our partner. We engaged Placemate. They're managing the program, which is great. Um, they've got this massive sort of software background database software system behind um, that does a lot of the work, um, makes a lot of the work really efficient and effective. And so that's really wonderful. Um, and the program, if you've already, already read about it a little bit, is designed to offer incentives to property owners. And so that they can turn smaller short-term rentals and maybe empty units into year-round rentals for people who live and work on the island. We are the first uh, lease to locals that's privately funded. All of the programs so far have been um, taxpayer funded and we're the first one on the East Coast. So that's great. So the placemates other markets so far have been um, ski towns, um, so Sun Valley, Breckenridge, um, Vail, their first program was uh, November 2020. It launched in November 2020. So it hasn't been that long uh, that they've been around. And I think some, what we've noticed is that some town governments across the countries have, across the country has been, have been um, doing this sort of on their own. We felt that partnering up with uh, Placemate was uh, going to hit the ground running pretty quickly. So what you received are the, believe the program guidelines, and this is a like in a nutshell, the program guidelines. So the idea is if your property has not been a year round rental in the past 12 months, and if you're not intending on charging more than $5,000 a month, which is a very high number, um, but we understand that we talked to some of the housing advocates we went to um, housing advocate meeting a few months ago and talked about this sort of putting a, a market rent cap um, that wouldn't prevent you know nicer properties and people who really fall into the I don't qualify for affordable housing you know they make enough money to be able to afford the rent um, but it's really a question of unlocking a year-round rental so we're certainly not suggesting that five thousand dollars is the average rent um, the incentives are up to $27,000 and I'll go through the sort of the schematic, the actual details of that. And they're based on the number of qualified tenants and the size of the unit. If at any point you wanna stop me and ask questions, please go ahead. Um, and of course, um, from the tenant's perspective, what qualifies them is that they work on the island, uh, that they work a minimum of 1500 hours a year and the idea there is that we do have some seasonality, whether it's in the landscaping business or the restaurant business, we have some seasonality even in year-round positions, quote year-round positions, um, teachers as well. And so we wanted to capture that. So the incentives, when you break them out, we're looking at uh, anywhere from a private room to really a two or three bedroom. I don't think that we're gonna get anything beyond that. Although there is one property right now that's um, in the pipeline that is a four bedroom house standalone on, on a single lot, which I think is amazing. Um, so if, for example, we'll, we'll give the example of a private room. If you're putting one person in a private room, you would get a $4,500 check. You would get half of that check when you sign the lease with the tenant and you would get the other half on the back end um, when the lease ends because we wouldn't want people to take the money and then kick people out and um, you know not have those people actually housed. 
Um, the number increases as you get into bigger units. We'll talk about a one bedroom for a second, whether it's an apartment or a one bedroom cottage. Um, it'll be $9,000 is the minimum that you would receive for one qualified tenant. But if you had more than one qualified tenant, up to two in the case of a one bedroom, you could get $18,000. And what qualifies a tenant is somebody who works on the island. That's a qualified tenant. A child is a qualified tenant. If you have more than one, more than one children, it still qualifies as one tenant. Um, so if it was, for example, a working parent and a child, that would qualify as two tenants and would give the property owner $18,000. Um, and so you can see that we're sort of capping it at 27 and we really want to hit this market of like the smaller units and see, see how successful it can be. Does that make a lot of sense? Does anybody have any questions about the, the incentives? Hearing none. Um, so early stage update, you're getting this update before uh, our board is. <laughs> so um, we have had inquiries from over 35 property owners. The last I heard was 35 and uh, nine of them are proceeding. Proceeding means they're either, um, they're getting verification from the tenants we're asking for um, employer letters basically to verify that they're actually working on the island and they're working the minimum number of hours. And uh, it could also mean that they're um, going through the property um, assessment. You know, we are looking for permitted dwellings, permitted accessory dwelling units. Um, and um, but those people are likely, you know, to go into the final stage and, and get a check and put in, um, have their year round tenants move in. So you can imagine the timing of this program was actually uh, was was by design. So the idea is if you've been short term renting, let's say your back cottage and your season is winding down, it's mid September um, and you maybe have a few more bookings. Maybe you have a few in the early October, but by you know mid October, your sort of calendars may be clearing up and then you start thinking about the winter and what are you going to do with the property. And so that's um, really why we decided to launch at the end of the summer. And we're just now doing the direct marketing to property owners. So we have um, a mailing that just went in the mail. Um, and these are postcards that we mailed to the roughly 2,500 property owners who are on the residential exemption list. And we're targeting the year round homeowners mainly because, um, you know, they, a lot of times they can have either secondary dwelling an accessory dwelling unit, you know, call it a basement apartment or even a private room. And in the inquiries that we've gotten, we have a mix. Um, a lot of two bedrooms, some three bedrooms, a couple of private rooms, and then a couple one bedrooms, and then that four bedroom, which I think is pretty amazing. Most people are showing up with a tenant in mind. That being said, um, we do have property owners who are showing up. They, Penny, please interrupt me, you feel free. Oh, sorry, you're muted. Oh, sorry, <laughs> thanks, just before I forget. So Julia, are you, are you, is this only for people to participate in who in the past have done short-term rentals or are we, are you targeting people that have existing rentals already? Are you creating new year round stock or rewarding those who are doing it now? So if we had unlimited amounts of money, I think we would reward anyone who is renting year round because they're so precious. Um, we are looking for new year round rentals. And so whether that in we're suggesting if you have a short term rental, you should look at this because it bridges the gap or very close to at least that's what we've been, you know, we did a lot of work on that figuring out the incentives. Um, it helps to bridge the gap between what you could make as short as a short term rental compared to what you could make as a year round rental. That being said, Penny, if the property is not being used right now, if it's a basement apartment, that's been sitting empty and your life situation is changing as a property owner, we would welcome you. And we have a, we have a, um, a decent number of inquiries from individuals like that right now. So just a follow-up question then, of the nine that you think are sort of on track, are they all new? Yes. Thank you. Yes. So of, to your point, of the 35 property, this is actually a really important message, I think to you guys, as policymakers on housing, 
of the property owners who have inquired of the 35, about, I think it's 12 showed up and said, well, I'm already year round renting. So that does not qualify you, right? But I'm bringing, I wanted to make that clear because it is definitely a part of the message we're hearing is it is becoming harder and harder for me to maintain my year round rental because of increasing costs. And I've, you know, I made it clear to these people, they should contact you guys. They should let you know, because as policymakers, I think it's important for you guys to hear this message. And as our um, output in terms of data, I would love to be able to come back to you guys and show you that sort of, you know, split, not just what we're able to convert, why we can't convert them into new, new year round rentals, but also like who's contacting us and who's interested in the program. Tucker, sorry. Can we come to Tucker? <clears throat> oh, sorry. Um, so Julie, I don't know if this is like uh, coming up or, um, so, so you have enticed someone who might've been short-term running before, or maybe put an unused uh, dwelling into the pool for year round, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, they, they do it. So a year round person moves in. How long is the commitment for the subsidy? So this is a, this is a great question. So this is a one year pilot program, right? And our goal is to prove that this can be successful on Nantucket, because frankly, up to now, these programs would be, have been ski resorts. There hasn't been any beach community, similar seasonality, but it's a different use. I'll give you an example. And you and I may have already discussed this. Existing programs for lease to locals actually target second homeowners. In Tahoe, in Vail, in Breckenridge, they're targeting second homeowners to ask them to convert their short-term rental or empty second home into a year-round rental. We have a different target market here. That's ultimately a target market, but we actually thought the first target market should be the year-round property owner who has another dwelling on the property, uh, a basement apartment, who may even be renting a private room, who may be doing it seasonally as opposed to year-round, uh, who may be doing a short-term rental, who may have it empty. So we need to prove the concept first. And I think what we're seeing is this is this is going to be successful. Our target is 20 units year one. It's a pretty conservative number. We really hope to run out of money and fill that target. Um, I think we've, we've already mentioned in the newspaper, but we're um, our pool of money is $300,000. That's the incentives that we're handing out. If we can't prove it successful, I mean, there's no point in new, doing year two. If this is as successful as we hope it will be, we want to make this a, a multi-year project or multi-year program. And um, we hope that the town would look at it, that you guys, that the Affordable Housing Trust would be look at it at least to see if you're interested. Um, we're approaching the community foundation to see if there's money available, certainly applying to their grant program, although that's not you know necessarily gonna mean that we can have a year two pilot program. But part of it is also we're fundraising. And this is a new um, avenue certainly for us to fundraise on the housing side. And um, so far, um, I think it's, I think, you know, early indications show that there is a lot of appetite and philanthropy. Um, but that seems to, that's certainly seem, you know, it has to be proven a little bit more than what we've done so far. Does that make sense? It, uh, it does. I mean, it obviously, one of the things I'm thinking about is, it, you know, get if we get a year rounder, you guys get a year rounder into a stable, affordable, suitable living situation, like don't want the rug to go away after 12 months. Yeah. And that's, that's a conversation we had. Brian, sorry, did you want to go ahead? No, no, no I'm just. Uh, well, that's, so that's a conversation going. we had with some of the donors to test that. And frankly, the reception was, if you can tell me who I'm helping, not necessarily the person, right? The pool of people. If you can tell me stories about how we're helping people in the community that are so that are so important to us, 
it's going to be hard for me not to give next year because I would never want to put them on the street. So add to, to your point. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, do you, Julia, do you have a calculator that you use to create the incentive amounts to show the deltas bet for homeowners between the costs associated with year round rentals and seasonal rentals? And is that something that you're willing to share with the public or with people so they can understand the differences? Because the reality is you're not talking about a large amount. When you talk about donors, and people living on the street, you're not, the incentive isn't that much money if you apply it to some of the broader marketplace. And I'm curious if you've really drilled down on the difference between landscaping expenses, paying a cable bill, paying a commission, short-term rental tax, all of the associated fees with a short-term rental, and then doing the conversion and passing some of those efforts on to a tenant. Yeah, so we have, and we spent, we didn't, it's not a public tool right now. I mean, I think that Brian, if you wanted to make it public, you'd have to make a lot of assumptions, certainly in terms of like, what could this property get for you? They would be generic properties, right? You'd have to sort of create generic properties, but not to say that that can't be done. Um, the way we've done it is first we used, you know, placemate, um, Colin, who is one of the co-founders of placemate used to be pretty high up at Airbnb. He's pretty familiar with, you know, the whole short-term rental market in general. And so his experience, and then we applied it to Nantucket and went and actually got, you know, went on Airbnb and Verbo and just looked for interested people who like they might be in our target market, an apartment, a second a back cottage, and see, okay, and engage them in conversations. How much money are you making? And then compared it to um, some of the utilization rates that we have. We have data on this stuff a little bit in terms of, you know, you're never going to fill your, your calendar entirely if you're short-term renting, right? Um, but you're going to make more money when you do fill it. And so, yes, yeah, so comparing I, that. I, I, I'd be really curious if that calculator became a public without any assumptions, just all blank fields that people could fill in. Oh, so interesting. Then so then you could understand like, oh, I'm really only making 6% more short-term renting once I take out all of these costs, whereas I could buy a lawnmower and give it to my year-round tenant. Uh, you know, like if, if you line up the, like, I, personally, I, I I don't believe the Delta is that significant if people sit down and scratch the math. And if there was a tool to scratch the math really efficiently, it might help people go through analyzing that your incentive could be more worth it to them. Yeah. That's actually a really good idea. I hadn't thought about it that way just to build the tool and then have like empty, you know, slots for just like, you know, whatever the line item is. And then people feel right. like, this is my, it's like yeah, my cleaning is $590 each time. It's 10 times. My cable bill is this much a month. My pool heat is this, my landscaping is this, my trash is this. Okay. All of a sudden the tenant just took all that on and they're paying me this much in rent. I can, yeah. And I think I make $500 a night, but really I only have X number of nights and really, you know, all this stuff like some, it, it is very interesting. You put in a vacant, yeah. A vacancy percentage. I'm actually only taking home $211 a night. I could do 210 on a year round rental. That's right. And when I have, so that's a great idea. And I will bring that to, to placemate because frankly, I think those guys are, they're rock stars at this stuff and that wouldn't be hard to create. And it's probably something that all their markets could use. So I think that's a great idea. I've done it personally with a few people, a few of the early inquirers, and it was like almost neck and neck. It, it, like, it, it, you know what I mean? It, 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 was, it, it was close enough that I was like, you got to do this. <laughs> right. So um, um, that come was to Tom. Good. Sorry, Julie, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I, I think we're in agreement. Okay. Tom? Hi, Julia. Uh, two quick asides, uh, little questions. Um, the other places that that you had on your list in the slide deck, like Truckee and South Tahoe and et cetera, what is their? Do you know what their funding mechanisms are? Are they are they municipal? Are they private? Are they state or a mix? It's all municipal. Okay. We are the first private pri privately funded. Okay. Private. Um, we're probably not the last, <laughs> but we're the first one. Um, it is a mix between. And because, you know, counties are more important in some states, right? So yeah. it's a mix between towns and counties. Um, 
sometimes they use the general fund and this I go from like from past conversations with Colin. Sometimes they're using the general fund. Sometimes they're using like a short-term rental tax or a lodging tax, you know, type, that type of thing. It, but anyways, they're all they're all uh, taxpayer or you know government money. Um, the main difference between our program and and the taxpayer-led program is that there are income restrictions in some of these markets. And I think, you know, we always, I've always, I've had that in mind since the beginning. I don't think it would be difficult to add an income restriction. Um, their system is built to take in that information. Um, so anyway, so I just want to make that clear because that's, I think I always had it in mind that it, the program may need to be modified down the road in, in terms of if, if there was ever government money that got involved. Okay. Th thanks for the, thanks for the info. And then the last little point is, and this might be in the regulations you sent, I just didn't see it. Was there any consideration of doing this program for just winter rentals? It, if like it the was, shuffle? Like, yeah. Yeah. Say it was like, um, I, I'm going to make this up like a visiting nurse or something at the hostel or somebody who came in and ne needed temporary housing. And, but there was the Delta and the off seat. I don't know if that exists. I'm just, it I'm does. Just... and actually, so some, again, some of these markets actually do, they have like a, you know, the ski season's a bit of a different, maybe it's a different animal because I don't know where the person goes afterwards. They go somewhere. They're going for a different job, I guess. They come here. They come here. They come here. Right. So like, exactly. So they're going to a different market. So they, I know a couple of their markets, or at least one that I know of, they have a minimum, I think it's Sun Valley, Idaho, they have a minimum uh, rent period of five months, right? It's not an, an entire year. The group of people, the board who, you know, the people who own landscaping businesses, they own building companies, they own, you know, they were not interested in the seasonal Um because it creates the shuffle and they were much more concerned about creating unlocking year round rentals. That being said, I think it, again, like when I say we're targeting year round property owners, step two in my mind is targeting secondary ho second homeowners. You, what you're talking about could very well be a phase two, phase three to unlock, you know, a different set of units. Okay. Just curious. Thank you, Julie. Penny. Yeah, again, um, Julia, I'm just curious, through, Brian, through you to Julia, why would you not have income restrictions? I mean, it would seem sensible to be serving those most in need. Well, um, we had, like I said, we had this discussion internally. Uh, I actually, whether it's rent caps or income restriction, kind of the same thing, right? No way, like, well, anyways, to some degree. But I when I discussed this at length with different individuals who were a interested in the program, b in the pre-launch period and b the housing advocates, what I got was there are a lot of people who just would not, you know, who'd be up either who would be up right above 150% AMI and it's private money. We don't have to have income restrictions. Right. So, as an initial program, we decided that just was not, it was more important about unlocking new units than and providing them to, you know, people who needed them than focusing on a specific, you know, portion of the market. Okay. Um. Julia, I Julia, I asked Vicky to take a look at the qualifications um, for tenants for a variety of reasons. Um, Vicky, if I may bring you into the conversation, sure. uh, I, I, some Mr. Concern, Chair, yes, I'm sorry. Just before you do that, um, Mr. Dubard had raised his hand. Okay, great, Mr. Dubard, do you have a question? I do. Thanks very much. Hi, uh, I'm. My name is Jeffrey Dubard. I'm the chair of the Affordable Housing Committee in West Tisbury and involved in these issues on the island. Um, with the program, I, I, I'm curious if you had, uh, I think it's Julia, if you had considered being able to offer, uh, um, if there was a way that somebody could claim a charitable 
gift by renting year round. I don't know if you, I assumed you're a nonprofit and, you know, mm -hmm. for someone who's got a house in a Greece to, you know, rent year round at what, you know, is a, you know, potentially a lower, lower income than they could. If, if rather than a literal payment, um, a way to reach a broader audience without needing the cash would be to offer a tax deduction. If you guys could do that through your organization. Yeah, that's a really good question. I, it's not something that we explored. Um, but I think what I'm hearing is kind of what I communicated a little bit earlier to the, you know, to the trust, like it's not a surprise to the trust, I'm sure, but we're hearing from a fair number of folks who either live on the Island, live off Island, who are year who are renting year round, you know, their whole property, they're part of the property. And it's sort of like getting harder and harder to keep that year round rental without, you know, they keep increasing the rent and they worry that people can't afford it and they're going to leave or that, you know, so there's a lot, there seems to be a lot of transitions, transition moments or sure. opportunities. So I think it's a bit, it's almost like a bigger policy question because when you start handing over an incentive to a year round rent to an existing year round rental property owner. Is that, that's kind of what you're talking about, right? You're, well, you're getting a big, broad market to your point. Well, so not necessarily, but if the person who's renting seasonally is doing it and saying, well, you know, end of the day by renting X number of months, I can make $27,000 more mm -hmm. per year. And you can say, look, you're, by renting year round, you're going to make $27,000 less, but we're going to give you, you know, credit for that as a charitable gift. Yeah, so that's you get to, so deduct, you mean that you get to deduct it from your. That's an interesting, I, you know what, we didn't look at that, but that's an interesting concept. Yeah. And frankly, basically, I think, I don't know if anybody you're basically, else. Uh, you're basically applying the concept of a bargain sale to a rental. Exactly. Where the person takes the Delta and gets it as a tax deduction. The only issue that I see that the with this program that Julia's created is the tenant and the homeowner are in the contractual obligation and Act Now is just paying them a fee. I think in what you're describing, and I've con conceptualized this before, if the non-for-profit were to be the tenant, right. then you could take the bargain okay. sale opportunity and then they sublet the, the property to the person that actually resides there. Could be the opportunity to capture the Delta. I, uh, I'd love to go on with this idea with you, Jeffrey, yeah. because it's a fair amount of yeah, time I thinking mean, about it. I've had some hmm. of these conversations actually with like our nonprofits and the charter school on the island about them being the, them leasing the properties, them right. entering into a contract. Right, I could totally see that. I so mean, that, I know so that, that it would be easier to do that, but yeah. Oh, right. It's a great I opportunity was... for winter rentals and school teachers, like a, a school non-for-profit to be able to house and where the seasonal resident may not be interested in the cash, but the deduction has a significant value in helping out a community member in a short period of time. That's exactly right. Adopt a teacher. Yeah. 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 Anyway, thank you guys. It's great to learn. from. I'm right, excited to meet you. Um, yeah. Thanks for coming to participate today. Let's share meeting times. I love, yeah, absolutely. I put all of your meetings on my calendar, so I'll, you'll get awesome. sick of me by the end of the year. No, thanks. no, no, no. More, more thoughts the better. Um, oh, Julia. So, I uh, thank you again, Jeffrey. Julia, I was coming to Vicky. I asked her to look at kind of the um, eligibility requirements and understanding that some of these programs have participated in states out in the Western Mass and concerns related to fair housing and selecting certain segments of the population, either employed or not employed or however it works and the exemptions. And how do we look at a program like this and making it work? Um, understanding that and then income restrictions became part of the conversation and review and so a variety. So I'll, I'll leave it to Vicki. Those are my questions to her. So you, Brian, just to make sure I understand, this is coming from the perspective of if the town got involved, right? Now, well, yeah, I, I didn't start with that thought process. I wanted to make sure that the program um, complied with fair housing in general, because that's important, regardless if the town was involved or not. 
Um, but if the town ever explored a future relationship, it, the, the, we have to explore it at some point because, of course, we're going to comply. Right. Understood. Uh, I'm happy to answer any question with the caveat that a lot of this work is, you know, place made and call in in terms of the fair housing. So I, I will probably be able to answer 90% of the questions, but there may be a subset that I would have to follow up with him. Great. Julia, I, I just want to say the program's fascinating. I mean, it's really um, a very interesting program that you've created here. That we so, found, um, that we found. Not that we created. <laughs> well, that, <laughs> whatever. It, it's yeah. definitely yeah. very beneficial to the residents um, here in Nantucket. In, in so, um, you know, like Brian said, he asked me to look at this from a perspective of compliance with fair housing, but also from um, the ten the qualified tenants. And so when I looked at this, first of all, I noticed that the fair housing, there's a, a, a line about fair housing compliance, and it really the obligation is on the homeowner. It's not on um, placemate, which, you know, really is running the program, um, or at least it doesn't say that in here, um, or, you know, your nonprofit or, you know, anybody else that may get involved, whether it's, you know, a broker who brings someone to your organization, you know, it, it doesn't say anything about compliance other than from the property owner's perspective. So is there, is that, that just, be that's not of in this way, policy? Or? It's probably because of the way the program is designed. So um, 90% of the time, the property owners are showing up with, with a tenant in mind. It's an arm's length transaction. So they say, you know, I have a friend or I know this person who works at this, you know, organization. And I really want to help them. And I have this basement apartment or so that's and that's been their general experience. Um, when a property owner does not have right okay. a tenant in mind, then a listing is created on their website. And that listing is then shared with an, a number. And this is what actually what Colin and I were talking about today, because we have a property owner who's in the pipeline who has, does not know who they're going to rent to. And we, by no means, want to be seen as cherry picking or, you know, any of that stuff. So um, what they do is they create a listing on their website and it can be a private listing, meaning you can share the, the, the pay, meaning it's not available to the whole, you know, internet, but to anyone who has the link, right? And um, what we've been discussing is sharing the link sort of very broadly with Housing Nantucket, with the people who've applied uh, as potential renters on the website, but we don't have a big pool of people who've applied for renters. So we were saying, how are we going to distribute this on a much more broad, on a much broader basis? And then whoever is interested contacts the property owner directly. The property owner contacts who they want to contact. We are removed from the those decisions. Okay. So um, there's no there's no means of monitoring what type of category of tenant they're going to take. Um, they can take whoever they want that's qualified by your policy. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. So that that's um it's not a concern right now because you're privately funded, mm -hmm. but um it becomes more of a concern if any public funds are accepted, whether by um state or even even some state programs get money from the feds. So so state, federal, CPA money, if if people I don't think any of that money would ever touch this program, right? In terms of state, federal, and if you do income restrictions, mm -hmm. um, certainly some of them will, I think, or would would you know be looking at that. But again, I think that your program, from what I understand, is really geared to incentivize the property owners. It's not for benefiting a, the. Um, so-called lower class, or I don't mean that, but um, no, it's more not, moderate income levels. Correct. It is effectively, it's 
market rate year round rentals, right? And so, you know, the market is, you know, what the property owner is willing to offer it for and what, where they can, if they can find a tenant to pay that. That's a little bit. And so does the property owner, how, how do they establish what they're going to rent the property for? Well, I think um, there are, we, we offer some guidelines in terms of what we're hearing sort of ranges, you know, one bedrooms tend to rent between X and Y or placemate offers some guidelines, but in general, I mean, it's word of mouth for them. That's my, I mean, you guys probably, Brian, you probably know this more than I do, but, and Penny, you probably know this more than my, than I do, but it's certainly, it's word of mouth. It's, you know, what are my friends doing? What are people doing? There's no. So they're not obligated to um, offer a reduced rate of rent. No. Okay. No. The and only so obligation is that we, we will not incentivize a property that is rented for over $5,000 okay. a month. And that's a pretty high bar. Yeah, that is. Yeah. And so does Placemate promote themselves as complying with fair housing laws or? I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. <laughs> I mean, presumably something is happening if there, I mean, when I look at how their documentation with local governments that they've worked with or that they continue to work with, it's extensive. And so I'm, you know, the guidelines that you see are just a fraction of what, you know, yeah. maybe a simplified version if you want. Yeah. So that, I guess that's why, you know, they would probably be complying with, and that's why I was looking for, for a statement in the policy to say that, because if they're accepting public or public funds for other communities, I would think that they're complying with fair housing laws. And so I guess I would naturally think that that would, um, that would be um, expected here as well, you know. Yep. And my guess is, you know, like I just said, my guess is we were looking to simplify the guidelines and we took out a whole bunch of sort of legalese stuff that um, we felt, you know, was not like because it's not government money. Yet. We didn't feel it needed to be in the document. And so how did you set the standard or the exceptions for the qualified tenants? Did you you said you looked at some legalese. Did you use some kind of other um, program or is this something that came yeah. from Placemate or? A lot of it came from Placemate and from okay. the design of other programs and from the standards that they've, you know, um, built so far. And um, it seemed very reasonable to me in terms of, you know, making sure that people who, you know, have a disability or people who have children or people who, you know, would not be somehow able to afford to rent. Yeah, would yeah. not be disqualified or. So the next question I have for you is, so if you go to the next step, perhaps, and you need more money to fund your program, um, and would you consider going to, you know, say the town or the trust to look for funds, um, would you be considering doing income restrictions um, on these? Yeah, rentals? that's why I, I mentioned to Tom. From the beginning, I was thinking and, and I had these discussions with Brooke, um, I had these discussions even with Ann Kutzpa, like in terms of there may be a reason to do it down the road if the town gets involved. Um, and, and frankly, I could even see like where, you know, let's say a portion of the money would be income restricted and maybe a portion of the money that's privately funded would not be income restricted. Mm -hmm. You know, So there could be continuation of the existing program to make sure the people who are under the existing program get to maintain their opportunities going forward, but also growing the program. Um, and I, quite frankly, I think um, a lot of the people who were going to help would qualify, understanding that you know, you guys have adjusted your definition of affordable housing in terms of like middle income, you know, who we're helping here. And I think if you set the bar at, let's say 150% AMI or something around there, I think you would capture a lot of who we're helping. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I'm seeing the list and it's like teachers, nurses, and it's right. like, there's, they aren't, I don't, I, I, anyway, so yes, does that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. No, again, um, I don't have any additional questions. You've answered really all the questions that I, you know, was focusing on as far as um, the tenants. Um, I don't know, Brian, do, three, do you have any additional questions uh, that I was concerned about? 
No, I think I think it's it's n- not for the moment, right? Like uh, excited to see their program, you know, get legs and see what comes out of it. I will note that it was clear to me in the experience when George Ruther came to Nantucket and we learned from him about um, some of the things that they work on in Vail is their local legislative process at both um, town and state levels are very different than in Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. So if you're working with place ma- setters or mates um, that are working in other regions, make sure that they are clear on the rules and regulations of Massachusetts and not just making assumptions from the Midwest um, yep. Yep. As, as you as you apply the program. Well, Brian, I'll give you an example of how things are different because we're in Massachusetts. So in some of these other, actually Placemate has um, licenses to operate as a real estate company in Colorado and California. And so they actually act as a bit, even more of like a matchmaker a property, you know, or a tenant matchmaker in some of their some of their locales they can't do that in massachusetts right so there are some differences in um the way that the program is developed because it's in massachusetts we also have a state anti-discrimination law that's pretty strong um Mm -hmm. and goes quite far beyond the federal fair housing act and i i mean it's been a big concern of ours not to ever be um not to ever shine a dark light on a program that is such a, you know, positive program. So um, it's, I appreciate, I totally appreciate that Judy. And it's, this is something we're, we're really keeping in mind because, you know, this is meant to be do good, no harm. Understood. Well, it's great that you've got almost nine conversions done. You know, congratulations to that. That's, that's great step. Great progress. Keep it up. We look forward to hearing more. Great. Um, I hope that, you know, it's about, you know, if I look at the pipeline, we're, we're probably allocating about a third of the money, maybe a little more. So um, I hope that, I think what we're going to see is there's a fair amount of people who are interested in converting like November 1st. That's their, their lease start date. Um, I think that's going to be kind of interesting to, to come back to you guys after you know, kind of mid November or maybe December to show you like where we are kind of the, you know, midway point or whatnot. And again, if you have anyone who's interested, um, placemate.com slash Nantucket, we need renters too, right? That's been part of the issue. And I know Anne's going to get um, whatever we get. Thank you very much for the time. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you, Julia. Um, coming back to the agenda, item five, six, seven, other business, next meeting, October 3rd. Uh, any comments, questions, thoughts on October 3rd? Seeing none. Any other other business? Seeing none. Board comments. Item 8. Seeing none. Uh, look for a motion for the purpose to consider the purchase, exchange, lease, or real value of property where an open meeting may have detrimental effect on the negotiating position of a public body. Penny, were you raising your hand? But, yeah, yeah, but I also, I'm sorry, I did ha- have a comment. This uh, circles back to the minutes. Can I talk about that now or should I hold it? That should, yeah, let's, we'll go back to board comments. Reopening item eight, board comments. Penny. Thank you. I just, um, I was doing a lot of proofreading this morning and yesterday. <clears throat> and I feel it's very important that Brooke reads the minutes where she's so heavily quoted that I wasn't at because. I'm not, I just want to make sure she has her eyes on this for the time that she was still our select board rep. Okay, great. We'll make sure that Ellis um, gets those minutes to her for review prior to the next meeting. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, and, I'll, make, I'll make a motion that we um, end our regular meeting, not to return for, to go into executive session for the purpose of um, considering purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property where an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the on our negotiating position as a public body. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Tom wins. Uh, vote by roll call. Dave Iverson. Sorry, Dave, you were muted. Uh, yeah, and that would be an aye. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Tom Dixon. Aye. Chantal Murphy. Aye. Penny Dye. Aye. Rima Sherry. 
Brian Sullivan is an I. Did I get everybody? Everybody just moved. I think I got everybody. So we'll see you in the other meeting. Judy, thank you. Thanks, Jeffrey. Yes, thank you, Jeffrey.